And with that, I'm very happy to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Doug Arendt. Uh, Doug is executive director of the Strategic Public-Private Partnerships at uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. And he's going to talk to us about establishing a community platform to advance energy, economic, and climate modeling by using open data sets. All right. Let's welcome Doug to the stage. Uh, I think you have that one. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Awesome. Wow, it's a very large room. Is this mic work okay? Yeah, good. Uh, nice to see a few people here, and I have no idea how many people are online. There, do we know? There are a bunch. Um, this is going to be a bit more motivational, uh, building off, uh, I think, the intro comments. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, that title's relatively new. I have spent 20-plus uh, years in the energy analysis and modeling world, uh, mostly leading uh, divisions and centers at NREL and working around the globe, working on energy planning, energy modeling, and, and maybe I'm going to expand that into operational elements to think about ourselves, uh, just following on Alex's comments of how the system itself can um, innovate at speed and scale to really address, uh, I think, some of the opportunities and, frankly, some of the challenges that we're seeing today. So hopefully this goes forward. Yeah, great. Um, this is going to be a, a, bit, a bit of background uh, that I think we're all very familiar with, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is pulled directly from the IPCC uh, AR6 report. Uh, pace and scale are not sufficient, and frankly, what we need to do is cut emissions faster than we've ever thought about doing, and principally that comes from the energy system. Uh, we'll get into the details of what that looks like. I think everybody's familiar with where the bulk of emissions come from, whether or not that's transport, power, or other industrial sectors, uh, depending on the country, et cetera. There's also a global problem that we're going to have to uh, deal with as well, and of course, uh, operational challenges. So when we think about this challenge, it's got three components to it, I think. And it's, a, it's nice to think about it structurally. Um, how do you plan for? So we've got bold ambitions. We've got statements of scientific problems. They come from AR6 or others. We've got the Paris ambitions and goals that are set out. We then have the ambitions that are then propagated through the Conference of Parties, the COPs, right? The tripling renewables, doubling energy efficiency, even tripling nuclear, et cetera. All those are oriented toward both decreased energy consumption or reducing growth in energy consumption and decarbonizing principally energy supply. And then you've now got increasing uh, now public commitment to uh, eliminating unabated fossil fuels. I don't know if you just saw that came out in the G7 communique. Uh, builds off of other work from the COP as well. And so what we see as energy nerds, for lack of a better way to call us, um, is that this is an economy-wide problem. It's got a very strong importance of a, de of a decarbonized power system as the backbone going forward, uh, because power is a principal area for uh, long-term emissions uh, and has been principally for emissions in most countries, but not all countries now. Um, and that's the real push on unabated fossil fuels and then into the transport sector. But you can see that from a business perspective that there are risks, from a corporate perspective there are risks, and that the dialogues around energy transition don't reside solely in ministries of energy or in FERC equivalents or in other regulatory equivalents. They actually reside in ministries of finance or in the multilateral development banks. And so while energy experts can provide insights, it's actually the communication of the financial and business opportunities of the energy transition, which I think will resonate with folks that aren't energy experts. And I think this is a really important thing to, for all of us to understand, is that good core modeling, good core operational energy platforms, be them open source or closed, are there operating for experts, but the folks thinking about the decision transition aren't experts. 
they, they didn't study power engineering, for example. They didn't study chemical engineering either. So I think the transition, the fundamental of the transition is illustrated here, and I think this is really important. This is the IEA's Sankey diagram of the world uh, reflecting 2021 energy flows. And I'm gonna transition to their Sankey diagram from the net zero study for 2050, and I'll just encourage you all to watch the contrast on the screen. So here, we're all pretty familiar with this, right? A fair amount of oil, coal, natural gas, a little bit of, uh, I'll call it other uh, energy source technologies transitioning over and a fair amount of, frankly, uh, uh, wasted energy in the system from the conversion processes, which many of them are 100 plus years old. And if you contrast that with what their view of a net zero world scenario looks like in 2050, again, this is from the first version of net zero scenario, not the recent updates. It is dramatically different, really fundamentally different. And so we've got two and a half decades to go to get from here to there at give or take 120, maybe $150 trillion of investment. That is an enormous business opportunity. It's also an enormous challenge. And there's a lot of dialogue over uh, whether or not there will be, quote, stranded assets and other things. What do you do with existing infrastructure? What do you do with jobs, workforce, et cetera? So there are a lot of moving parts which are just not about the energy system itself. It is the energy ecosystem more broadly. People, decisions, finance, and flows. And in particular, on the technical side, going back to maybe Alex's introduction, the dynamics of the operating system are going to be much different. We can, there are many of us in here that can talk about that in detail. I'm not gonna talk about that, um, but we can get into that in Q&A. But you can see this system is dominated, one, by power, secondly, by renewable power, and then it still has some oil and coal in it and natural gas in it. Much of that is abated, if not all of it, and then, of course, there's other non-energy sector emissions profiles that we haven't even talked about here that, again, need to be in the decision complex, i.e. thinking about land use change, oceans, uh, direct air capture, and other pieces as well that aren't really captured on this diagram. Actually, DAC was. So I think I want to go from the big picture, big Sankey diagram of the world, to a narrow example and think about that because Implementing energy is not just a national issue and a, a global issue, it's a local issue, right? We all uh, appreciate the fact that um, the local utility is serving this building right now uh, very appropriately. We have lights on, we have the IT system, et cetera, et cetera. We all got here transport some way or another, whether or not that was walking with clothes and other things that were produced in an industrial process or on mass transit or otherwise. But this pretty picture of a city, it, you know, looks like a city. But actually, if you look underneath it, it is a complex, interconnected set of energy economies moving forward, right? There's power, there's gas, there's actually water, which is connected to energy. There's mobility systems, many mobility systems in this city itself. And so how does one think about helping cities transform because cities have governance that we also have to work with. We have to work with the city councils, the mayors, the governors, uh, the, the local utilities, et cetera, over that as well. And so it's not just a national issue. It's everything from national to local. And we have to think very differently about that. So I have a couple of key messages just to ground us in understanding we have to be both experts but work with frankly, a community of folks that are experts in their own ways, but we have to work, figure out how to talk to each other and how to work through the problems. And for us, how to communicate the complexities of energy simply. And I think that's really important. So there's a couple of key points and why I chose to spend my time here, I think to help motivate us, 
now for the next 20 years is because for the past 20 years we've made a lot of progress, but the next 20 years we have a lot of work to do. That energy transition is a huge amount of work and it's up to us to work together to help accelerate that um, and do that differently. And so it's the key message here is implement differently, innovate differently. I think it goes back to the power that can come through open source and I think that's really important and do it through partnership, so I'll get to this more importantly. So from the energy system, because energy uh, leaders, they want confidence that the energy system will operate reliably, affordably, preferably sustainably, deliver returns, and of course, apply or uh, follow the requirements of uh, what both their stakeholders, but more importantly, their customers uh, demand of them uh, in terms of delivering reliable, sustainable, affordable power or other energy outputs. And I think this is really, really important. The modeling community itself, whether or not that's modeling for planning, modeling for building, and, and investment, or frankly, developing operational tools which are based upon software, right? Look at power systems, look at uh, any petroleum plant itself. That's all operating systems which are intensely censored and now increasingly integrated with AI, ML, and huge data sets, and it's a software compl complex that is helping control those systems and make them operate or allow them to operate much more effectively and efficiently. And so these attributes here in terms of advancing the decision making, that decision making is from global all the way to lo managing an operating plant is really, really important. And doing that means that we have to take a different approach. It is not a new tool for every problem. I think this has been the challenge of our community in the past 20 years, is that we have a client that comes to us, whether or not that client's internal, external, or elsewhere, and says, oh, I really need some new insights on this particular problem, be that problem of, oh, how do, we, how do I think about producing green hydrogen, uh, but really, I didn't, I'm not really thinking about hydrogen, I'm thinking about methanol or ammonia for export markets, and so, one who thinks about that uh, mathematically says, oh, I think I know how to solve that problem. So here, let me derive a model for you that takes renewable resources, converts them to power, takes power to electrolyzers, take electrolyzers through a Sabatier process and give you methanol, or I'll take you through Haber-Bosch because I'm not going to innovate those because I don't know those because I'm not a chemist. And I'm going to give you a mathematical model of creating green methanol or green ammonia. Oh, then I can model shipping, et cetera, et cetera. But that's one person's view of how to go about and think about the planning and investment requirements, probably the infrastructure requirements, et cetera, versus saying, hmm, who else in the community actually is an expert who's already done the power system modeling? Who in the community has done expert modeling of electrolyzers or Sabatier processes or uh, alternative uh, uh, Haber-Bosch processes, and can I create an ecosystem where I can bring that expertise together and I can get all of those models which have been invested in for decades and actually get them to work as part of an ecosystem rather than create my own. Most people will just create their own. And that's a real call for us to work together, to collaborate and, and go forward. And this has to be done in a way that is very different than we have done in the past. And are you going to give me a time frame? Because I'm not paying attention, so I apologize. Thank you. Um, so let me go through this. Uh, principles that I think we have to think about, and these, this is not meant to be comprehensive, but to get conversation started and hopefully um, propagate through a, a set of discussions and frankly work streams that could come out of this, this policy workshop is, is there agreement to move into open source? 
how do we embrace interdisciplinary approaches to this? How do we leverage the community? I think is a real key thing here, et cetera, et cetera. So um, interoperability is key because again, uh, some tools need to be developed to answer questions in a given part of the ecosystem, but the, 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 the vision here is to create tools which are complementary to other tools to get across the whole ecosystem. And so we developed this idea maybe five or six or seven years ago, recognizing at least in our own ecosystem environment at NREL, that the past organization of our own energy economic models looked a little bit like this, and it's blurry for a reason because there was no coordination among it. We were developing tools for each different problem, whether or not they were operational or planning. They went from steady state dynamics all the way up to investments. They went from local, i.e. to a, you know, operating a, a, a device and a device in a, in a local system all the way up to doing national scale models. We didn't run a global model. Um, that's a whole other piece. And then we came up with this kind of, uh, I'll call it approach to an architecture can we actually have an architecture that we're designing to? And I think that that's really important. So this one shows, I'll call it uh, a, a, a rational approach to that. Has it held? Not necessarily, because we're even ourselves 4,000 people. We have hundreds of tools and models that are developed each year. We serve hundreds of clients, and it's hard to get that architecture to, to hold. But we're making progress. You'll hear from some of my colleagues later. And then there's another layer that I put on top of this, which is really from local all the way up to global. And I think that's really important. There is, however, an example that we should learn from very carefully. And it's the Community Earth System Modeling uh, con Consortia, which is global. It's been going for decades. And these are uh, the, the, the set of uh, national entities and now academic entities that have contributed to the climate modeling community now for 50, 60, 70 years almost. They develop expertise in given modules. Those modules are designed to interact with other modules for a holistic climate modeling capability. They run interoperability capabilities. The models, the data sets are all open. They have worked through this in a very structured way. And so I hold that as an example that we all could learn from uh, and take forward. And I would welcome, you know, uh, it needs a leader, a coordinator. So I think, uh, you know, LF, the Linux Foundation here, and LF Energy uh, could, could definitely play a, a very key role here. And then I developed a napkin uh, thinking about the energy infrastructure and frankly, how complex it could be. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the napkin diagram that's cleaned up by, by a graphic artist, and it literally was a napkin. And it was, wow, we think about earth systems and physical systems and human systems and, of course, the economic systems. That's all wrapped in what we want to do, and there are feedback loops through all of that. It's not a one-way flow of information. And then if you look at the bottom of this diagram, this is where... There's a huge amount of energy and information, huge data sets, and the plethora of uh, ad infinitum papers of going from this algorithm to that algorithm under AI and ML of saying, oh, this does better than that. And you know, I think the real question is, is, does it represent the physics when you need physics represented well? And I think that that's a real key question to understand. Is, are they better, faster than the physics-based models? And we've got some of those examples, I think Gord will talk about them from the NREL side in terms of downscaling climate modeling and actually to be useful for energy planning modeling going forward, which I think is really important example because that part of the loop has not been closed. And I would just offer from my, even my own 20 years that when we do energy planning, and in fact most energy planning models today, they use historic data and at best, they might use a couple of years of historic data. I think we use seven. There are a few others that regretfully only use one year of representative data. And I don't think that we're doing our policymakers or our investors or our boards a service 
by not understanding how limited that is in terms of capturing the, uh, sorry for, for those, uh, the fat tails of, 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 of weather events and the distribution of weather events in terms of thinking about planning, informing policy, investment, et cetera, for a decarbonized, resilient, robust, affordable uh, energy system in the future. Designing for 2050 means we have to understand what is the variability, not of the past, but also of the future. And if we don't do that well, we're not doing ourselves, uh, we're not doing our job as best as we should. So, let me wrap up. This is important for us to do it well. It's important for us to implement at scale, to innovate differently, as I said, to innovate at speed, goes back to how do you churn through things very well, to engage. This is one of the really important pieces that we have to understand is that we no longer have, you know, in some sense, the patience and the time to go through a long iterative process for holistic energy planning and take 10 or 15 or 20 years to build out the next set of infrastructure. That infrastructure has to be built, planned for today and going forward. This is a really key thing. And I say do it through partnerships. So uh, let us all hopefully join together uh, to, to, to really step up to this challenge, do things differently, uh, spend time communicating with our colleagues and frankly, uh, working through to, to create a community of practice uh, that both helps on the planning side, but also how to build, how to inform building, and how to operate. So thank you very much. Hopefully that fit the time frame. Okay. Great. I've got time for a couple of questions if there are any. If not, we'll, uh, we'll turn it back. So thanks very much. Any questions or comments? Reflections? It's a very big room. And I don't know how we do online, to tell you the truth. So, yeah, go ahead. For data for the climate scientist? So, um, if I understand correctly, so the question was, what did the climate community have to do in order to be able to share data, to put up collective data? So they had, uh, I believe, if I, my memory serves me correctly, a data interoperability working group, a data standards group, and they agreed on the original architecture of what the data, um, the data architecture would be, and uh, so that included resolutions, space and time. It included what attributes and what were the, uh, the metrics of the attributes that they were going to, to agree to. And that has evolved over time because the original data sets, like frankly, the original computing capability was only available to work at um, what I consider very coarse resolution. They will, of course, yell at me and said, that's the best available it was. It was like one or two degree global resolution. That's hundreds of kilometers for, a, for a, uh, um, a, a, a scale, right? So it's one point representing that. So that has gone down to, I believe, a quarter of a degree uh, right now, and that's the definition of how they operate and work. And so they've aligned to that uh, to do their meshes correctly, and then uh, they've improved the number of data points that are in a a given geospatial cell uh, because they're, they're getting more and more, um, uh, what's the right way to say it, more and more modules which are looking at more physical processes in that given cell and the interaction of the processes. And many of those processes are uh, both, uh, I'll call it near, and have very long interconnectivity uh, in terms of global circulation patterns and things like that. And so they have to have that agreement uh, platform. And I, that, I, it's, it's almost a bit more straightforward for the chemistry and the physics of the climate than it might be for an energy system because energy systems you might have to get down to seconds. Uh, you have time zones that you have to compare uh, to work with. 
Uh, you then have some processes where you need to do uh, additional technical uh, scenarios that might be sub-second, right? But that would be complementary and additional to, I'll call it the bulk of what might be needed from seconds to years. Uh, and so there might be, a, a, again, an architecture of the data collective, shall we say, that might be appropriate for those different time scales that I showed on that map and different temporal scales as well as different spatial, uh, different regional scales, jurisdictional scales. So long-winded answer, but it needs a data architecture community to agree to that. So, yeah. Two more, I think, or three more, yeah. And again. Yeah, I mean, probably not. So the question was, how do you deal with what might be considered um, either secure or regulated data sets that are not supposed to be shared with other entities? And I, I think the answer there might be that um, you create um, a, a data enclave that's actually uh, at, an, at some organization which uh, is uh, uh, independent. Um, that could be a role for national labs, could be a role for somewhere else, uh, that uh, protect the necessary attributes of the data, possibly synthesize it where it's needed across the, uh, the boundaries, um, and do it in a secure way. So I, I, I don't think that that's an over, uh, a barrier that we can't overcome. I just think we need to talk about what the solution could be and invest in the infrastructure to do that well. So, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, if I understood correctly, how will the partnership operate, right? How could we actually get it up and running? It was the question. And I'll just take the example again from the community earth system modeling community. It was and is a program that has funding from the interested agencies to their national entities to do both national modeling, but also to be part of the global community. And so, there's agreement from and vision from funders. Uh, in this particular case, I don't think that that needs to be solely government funders. The, you know, the, the, the membership of LF Energy, be it corporate as well, I think there needs to be an agreement and a program and that collaborators in that program need to understand, well, one need to, to be motivated to be part of it, and secondly, need to find a value proposition in it. And I think that's really important. And I think that you know, there's conversations here over the next couple of days where there's a lot of value in actually being part of a modeling community, be that modeling for planning or operating or building, uh, and because you can leverage your time and resources because someone else is doing that, is doing something else that's complementary. So there's a commitment there's a program coordinator, which is a very important function that needs to be put in place. Uh, and then there needs to be an architecture and a vision. 
and frankly, tactically, there needs to then be working groups uh, that actually work on the problems. They go to the data architecture. They define data architectures for given problem sets uh, where people can collaborate. So, I, I, I you know, that's my that's my answer. I think there are probably other uh, variants that could could uh, add to that. You had one more, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so again, question is, is how do we work through the heterogeneity of both institutional models, which might be open source, but they really aren't collaborative, or frankly, a, a fairly embedded base of proprietary models that are sold not only as models, but also as the basis of a service industry? Is that a fair restatement? Okay. Um, so, I, I, again, I think there has to be a collective willingness, both not just from the development community, but frankly from the end user community, to think about what are the benefits of advancing an open source framework. And, I, you know, I, I don't think we can do everything at the same time, but pick off a couple of good pieces of the challenge and the puzzle. Maybe, you know, if the community agrees that they really want to dive into power systems or power systems plus power to X, as I used the, the early example of hydrogen, I think that'd be really quite interesting. There are proprietary models which are in the backbone of most utilities worldwide. Uh, one, they're sold. Secondly, they're a basis of service. There's a lot of proprietary planning models which... Uh, are, again, the basis of service and sales. Uh, all of those, uh, geez, I'm getting kicked off, but let me, let me go through this. Uh, I think that if we take the Linux model itself, which is let's create an innovative platform and y encourage the companies to derive services off of those, Red Hat as an example and many others, that Everyone's going to be better off. The innovation ecosystem is going to move much more quickly, as Alex said at the beginning. The services will derive and advance. And frankly, they'll be able to incorporate much more innovation in the operating entity. And so I see a huge amount of innovation right now coming from the AI side doing uh, controllability of the Internet of Energy things, for example, that's got communication in it, it's got cybersecurity, it's got controls, it's got advanced AI, it's got communication up to the RTO and the ISO, et cetera, but that's and that's operating. But, but each of them are going after a value proposition which is actually about monetary ch exchanges by leveraging IT infrastructure and uh, standards and, and communications, right? If those standards and communications can be open sourced or open source and have interoperability standards for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of devices, then the business model innovation can continue to evolve. And so it, again, it has to be a collective willingness of the community to move forward. So sorry, I've got the, the time's up, Mark. So thank you, appreciate it. I hope that was helpful to get things started.